My name's Bronwyn Winter. I'm, uh, what can I tell you about me? I'm Emeritus Professor of uh, the University of Sydney, Emeritus Professor of Transnational Studies from the University of Sydney, where I did bitter battle for 30 years um, in uh, the difficult context for lesbian feminists that is academe and more and more difficult these days. Um, been a lesbian and feminist activist for longer than that and um, here in Australia active in um, three groups. I'm on the committee of the Coalition of Activist Lesbians. I am um, a co-founder and co-convener of the group Australian Feminist for Women's Rights, a FORWA, which came together to lobby the left from its left flank because we're a little bit sick of the right grabbing hold of this issue. And I'm also involved with LGB Alliance, um, doing a few things with them from time to time. So that's what I do. I've written some books and stuff, but you can look me up. All right. I'm speaking to you today from Marrickville, which is its uh, white people name. And its um, Indigenous name is Gadigal country and also Wangal country and of the Eora nation. I'd like particularly tonight to pay respects to all the lesbian aunties, past, present and emerging, and all the um, Indigenous women and particularly Indigenous lesbians who are here tonight, whether you're from Aotearoa or from Oz. Anyway, so... Um, just a few words before I introduce our three speakers. As um, you've probably heard, this is a lesbian event and specifically lesbian panel this evening. Now, in introducing this panel and the three, spe uh, and the three speakers, I'd just like to say just quickly a few words about why this is important in the context of WDI to foreground lesbian voices. <clears throat> now, as many of you will know, we've long had discussions and often heated debates in the feminist movement about the marginalization of lesbians and, um, and of lesbian feminist analysis of heterosexuality as not only a sexual choice, but a political system, even as lesbians have given enormous energy to the feminist movement and many of the movement's political gains and cultural productions would simply not have existed were it not for that lesbian energy and lesbian political analysis. Now, you've probably heard that before, and I don't need to rehearse those arguments further here. But I do wish to point out, for those who may not know, another area in which lesbian lives and politics have perhaps been overlooked and is directly relevant to why we're all here today. Gender identitarianism as an ideology and political movement began long before it came onto the radar of many women who are now gender critical or gender abolitionist. Myself, I'm gender abolitionist um, as a result of the institutionalization of trans ideology and its influence in many places, law, policy, schools, universities, sports, healthcare, the running of women's refuges and other women's spaces, and of course the care or rather lack of care of children's welfare. But this incursion began in the mid to late 1980s. Now, we're talking 35 years or so, yeah? With attacks on lesbian spaces, voices, cultural projects, individuals and community. And we were there. <laughs> Pretty, I think everyone, did, everyone speaking tonight was there, all the lesbians speaking tonight. Transentrianism into lesbian spaces, politics and lives and the propaganda that accompanied it and was sadly so willingly lapped up by so many women, was the precursor, the experimental site, if you will, for subsequent transentrianism into our wider political landscape. There are many examples of trans-identified males claiming a lesbian identity and access to lesbian spaces. Among them, just to give you some Australian examples, uh, the New Zealand ones I'm, I'm less familiar with, among them are the hugely vehement and divisive debate over the inclusion of trans-identified males in the Sydney Lesbian Space Project, and I found myself in the middle of that debate, a shouting match over the participation of trans-identified males at the Brisbane Lesbian Conference in 1994, the splits within the Women's Circus in Victoria, which Susan knows all about, and the lawsuit against Sappho's party in South Australia. Those are just a few examples. What was the most deeply distressing to us as lesbian feminists, as it has been distressing for many other women since, is the enthusiastic championing of the trans agenda by so many lesbians and so many women, and the vitriol with which women attacked each other. Most of the vitriol, as far as I'm concerned, came from the pro-trans women, but I'm not going to pretend for one second 
that everyone on our side was an angel either. One attendee at the 1994 Brisbane conference reports being deeply shocked at seeing women literally screaming at each other from both sides. It was her first encounter with trans entryism into lesbian space. And this is how destructive it's been that setting women against women as we know very well. Since the Sappho's party case almost 20 years ago, lesbians wishing to gather in a women only setting have had to return to the bad old days of having to network underground. Yeah, it's like we're back in the 1940s or 1850s or something. I know that today many gender critical or gender abolitionist heterosexual women are facing the same problem as we have faced for over three decades. But the question is begged, why did they start by attacking lesbian spaces and projects? Logically, they could perhaps presume, uh, presume that heterosexual women would be more male identified than we are and perhaps more amenable to, to accepting um, their agenda. And of course, male identified lesbians exist too. But um, I don't think that trans activists, I don't think that was their issue. I think it's the same old issue, the same issue that men have always had with lesbians escaping male power. They chose to hang out with us because they want, they, they were, they were, we're talking about straight men, we're not talking about effeminate gay men, which is the sort of stereotypical image most people have in their heads when they're thinking of, of, of trans identified males in most of the general public. We're talking about straight men with a woman fetish. Yeah? And men who cannot stand that women escape their sphere of influence, escape them sexually, escape them emotionally, escape them politically. And that's always been, and I class these men in the same class as all the men who've always harassed us, raped us, attacked us because we organize among women and we seek fulfillment, including sexual with other women. And, and it's the same sort of lesbian hatred. I don't think they're pro-women at all. I think it's lesbian hatred and they cannot stand that women, and it's also a fetish. Yeah. So I, I think that the fact that they started with lesbian space was, from my point of view, pretty logical. But um, we, we've had this around for a long, lot longer than some other women have experienced it. So we're speaking from long and bitter experience. And it just shows to me also, and this is the last thing I'll say before introducing Susan, the, is that the most radical thing a woman can do still, the most radical thing we can do is claim our own space our own voices, our own autonomy from male dominance. Because this agenda, this gender identitarian agenda, just in case no one understood this or with anybody in this room that didn't understand it, and I think you probably all do, is that it's another prong in the arsenal, the ideological and strategic arsenal that the patriarchs are using to take power away from women and to undermine any attempt by women to, um, to gain power. All right, so on to the speakers. Before I introduce them, however, I'll do some housekeeping. I'll probably have to repeat it afterwards, but I'll do it now anyway. Anna is um, moderating, taking care of recording, wave to Anna. Um, and uh, Anna Kerr, who is, as most of you probably know, um, runs the Feminist Legal Clinic in Sydney and has been coming up against this, this battle herself um, in many ways. Okay, so first speaker, Susan Hawthorne. Now, Susan is also on the committee of the Coalition of Activist Lesbians, and Susan has been writing about lesbians since 1975. So we've been in this, you know, we've been talking about this stuff for a long time. And she's written, I'm very impressed by this number, at least 60 articles with the word lesbian in the title. She has been involved in lesbian activism, protests, and the creation of lesbian culture, um, including... Um, the older women's circus, as, as um, I mentioned, the women's circus just now. She's an aerialist, she's a poet, she's a novelist, and a feminist theorist. And she's, and she's also co-founded and is co-publisher of Spinifex Press. She is, in addition, an adjunct professor at James Cook University in Townsville, and she lives and works on Jira Country. And her talk is called Do Lesbians Exist? I think we have a very short answer to that one, but please, Susan, do go on. Okay, so I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking from Jiru country where I live and work and respect my, uh, pay my respects to the elders. Uh, I also acknowledge all the lesbians who fought for the freedom of women and lesbians um, in the last couple of centuries, uh, sometimes at the cost of their lives. 
I want to begin with a, a quote from my book, Vortex. Rape, torture, silence, shame and hatred all combined so that no one ever hears of the violations of lesbians' human rights. It's invisible. It's as if it doesn't exist, just as lesbians don't exist. So as Bronwyn said, I've been writing about lesbians since 1975. In 1976, I wrote uh, In Defence of Separatism, and that remained unpublished in full until 2019. In that, I wrote about heterosexuality as an institution in a section called Things Peculiar to Women's Oppression. As well as heterosexuality, I included rape and romantic love. Towards the end of the book, I outlined how lesbian feminism is important to feminist political successes. Even I'm surprised at how often and how much I've written about lesbians. But my guess is that the vast majority of these writings across fiction, poetry and non-fiction is pretty unknown, certainly in the mainstream. It's not just the bad things that happen to lesbians that are invisible and erased. It's also the marvellous and wonderful things lesbians have achieved. When colonisers conquer a land, their first reports back to empire usually contain something along the lines of the natives possess no culture. This is a very fine way of excusing themselves for conquering and dispossessing other peoples. It also excuses their future actions of imposing their own culture and their own values on the colonised peoples for their own good. Eventually, the colonised begin to believe the lies they are told by the colonisers and so are submerged again in the imperial culture at which they have to excel in order to get along in the world. Uh, I actually wrote that back in um, what, 2003 in a, um, an editorial for The Age, I had, which I had forgotten. It wasn't published, of course. Um, lesbians remain colonised and in the current era, lesbians are recolonised by the self-IDing of men who call themselves women and even lesbians. Language has been weaponized by the trans lobby and just week, last week on the Johns Hopkins University website, a lesbian was defined as a non-man attracted to non-men. It has now been taken down, but no doubt, because many lesbians protested this vociferously. In my talk tonight, um, I want to talk on the terrible and the terrific, but I'm going to begin first with the terrible. In 2002, I was at a World Women's Congress in Uganda. Towards the end, there, there was a session on radical feminism in Africa, so I went to listen. I asked the quest a question about lesbians. After the session, a woman approached me and said, be careful, be very careful. In this country, they torture lesbians. Her name was Christine. I sat with this sentence for a long time and decided that I needed to know more. I began my search for evidence of lesbians who were tortured. The most important essay I read was by Consuelo Rivera Fuentes and Linda Burke, published in 2001. There are very few first-person accounts of the torture of lesbians. Consuelo was tortured during the Pinochet regime in Chile, and they intensified the torture when they, because they knew she was a lesbian. I knew her only through this article, but subsequently we met and became friends. I also found information on the torture of lesbians in Uganda in a book published by Amnesty International in 2001. But here it was already evident that lesbians were nowhere near as important as gay men and transsexuals who took up most of the book. Over the next 15 years, I continued to search for material on lesbians who are murdered, raped and tortured. And I document what I found in my book, Vortex, The Crisis of Patriarchy. I was also writing a novel, Dark Matters, in which two lesbians are attacked in a pre-dawn raid, one is arrested and the other shot. It's a book about the ways in which lesbians are violated, but also about how our stories have disappeared. It's also about love and commitment, memory and imagination, misunderstanding and misrepresentations. It tells of the resilience of lesbians. 
When I joined the women's liberation movement in 1973, two of the things that inspired and sustained me were, were poetry and art. Throughout the last 50-odd years, I've admired the artworks of lesbians like Suzanne Bellamy, uh, singer-songwriter Alex Dobkin, as well as bands, theatre, circus, and, and a huge range of poets. I remain an avid reader and have attempted to add my own words to this lesbian culture. And between the projects listed above, I wrote six collections of poetry which celebrate lesbian lives, as well as storytelling and prehistory. I quite frequently invent gatherings of lesbians that cross time zones because you can get away with this in poetry. Um, the books include uh, The Butterfly Effect, Unsettling the Land with Suzanne Bellamy, Cow, Lehman, Blueprint Lamb and The Sacking of the Muses. I mention this because the creation of lesbian culture is critical to our survival and to a thriving cultural and political epoch. Just as lesbians at the turn of the 19th and 20th century through to post-World War II era created so many works that we can relish today. Lesbian history tends to work diagonally through aunts and nieces, mentors and apprentices, through communities of like-minded women. This is why lesbian spaces are so important so that we can come together, talk and argue, sing and dance and have extraordinary experiences, such as the lesbian concert in the Sydney Opera House at the end of the Lesbian Festival in 1991. Thank you, Bronwyn, for stage managing that event. I only found that out last week. The trans attack on lesbians began in the 1980s and has picked up enormously since then with billionaires funding medical transition, media whitewashed legal fictions and more. In the meantime, lesbians are unfunded and not advocated for because, as Gillian Hanscom writes, no one is proud of dykes, only other dykes are proud of dykes. That's from her book, Sybil, The Glide of Her Tongue. It's published by Spinifex. Um, the se next session is, is about lesbians versus the, versus the TQ plus brigade. I want to speak about several personal experiences here that I've had that have helped me deep in my thinking about the trans lobby. I was a member of the Melbourne Women's Circus when in April 2000 a trans woman in inverted quotes wrote and asked if he could join the Women's Circus. Circus is a place of physical and emotional trust. There is bodily intimacy and balances and double aerials acts. Over the next six months, his application was talked about by members of the circus. And to my knowledge, no other applicant was ever accorded this privilege. It was a privilege because in the past, membership was either accepted or denied, no discussion. In his case, there were clear boundaries for denying it. He was not a woman who had been subjected to sexual abuse or rape as a woman. The issue of boundaries was raised, to which I answered in an open letter that I wrote. Women living outside the state of Victoria are not permitted to join. Women under the age of 18 are not permitted to join. So I asked, is the boundary woman any less difficult to define than these rather arbitrary boundaries which are already in place? From 2017 to 2020, I researched, uh, did research on my book, Vortex. I have to say that the most difficult chapter in this book was the one I called Breaking the Spirit of the Women's Liberation Movement, The War Against Biology. Difficult because the material at that time was so contradictory. It was Jennifer Billick whose articles pointed me to the billionaires and organisations like Denton's and Reuters that helped me make sense of the huge forces set against us. Throughout the book, I have section on money trails in, in all but the introduction. And so among the money trails are the medical industrial complex making profits from people with disabilities alongside eugenic policies, uh, Soros and other libertarians decriminalising prostitution, info and biotech companies such as Bill Gates and Monsanto and Bayer, profiting in the area of bioprospecting, patent foods and GMOs, the deterritorialization of indigenous peoples, the colonized and ongoing practices of slavery have reaped huge 
are profits for colonial empires. The trans billionaires and big pharma who are making huge profits from the trans industry and the fossil fuel miners, IT companies and eugenicists who are in climate denial and climate profit. Lesbians are targeted by the trans industry, but there isn't even a pretense that money should go to lesbians unless they're a sub subset of LGBTQ+. Any externally well-funded lesbian organisation, I have to mention Astraea here, is, in my view, suspect. Lesbians have to raise all the funds from our own projects, such as Matrix Guild in Melbourne. My final example comes from an interaction I had with the International Alliance of Independent Publishers based in Paris, an organisation Spinifex has been a member of since 2007, and for four years I was the English language coordinator and on the governing board. In April 2022, the Alliance decided that the long-standing feminist section should be called the Feminist and LGBTQ Plus section without discussion with feminist publisher members. I said this was like suggesting Monsanto should join the ecology section. One of the principles of the Alliance is decolonisation. I protested and pointed out that feminists and TQ plus lobby have nothing in common and completely different objectives. I mentioned three billionaires, John Stryker, Jennifer in quotes Pritzker and Peter Buffett, and wrote the following about the transgender lobby and its billionaire funders. When same-sex marriages laws were being fought for, these billionaires gave huge amounts of money, and it meant that the T had to be added to the LGB. This creates a system of astroturfing, a very 21st century means of advocacy. Organisations mask their sources of funding to appear to be a grassroots organisation, just as uh, uh, AstroTurf is fake grass. AstroTurfing refers to organisations that are fake, fake grassroots, that is, phony movements. These billionaires are responsible for a huge increase in visibility and funding to trans organisations. They've been supported by the UN, who are mostly following the Yogyakarta principles, which are not ratified by the UN, but they're treated as if they are. They contradict CEDAW, um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, by presenting intergenerational sex, that is pedophilia, as a freedom. I was unsuccessful in challenge changing the Alliance policy. And while we remain members, uh, we are trying to slowly talk with other feminist publishers to encourage them to be brave. To their credit, the Alliance did attempt to discuss the issue further with us, but they seem not to understand the gravity of the situation for women, for lesbians and for feminist publishers. At the time of speaking with them, there were no tea publishers, but they still preferred to have a welcoming LGBT plus, LGBTQ plus section than to support the feminist publishers already active in the organisation. I also pointed them to the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, informing them of the signatories from countries around the world. None of this had any impact because we are meant to be kind even to our oppressors. Every lesbian who is aware of the consequences of these policies of the hatred implicit and explicit at the root of the TQ plus lobby is up against a huge well-funded marketing campaign with governmental and UN uh, support, with rare exceptions such as Reem Al-Salem, the UN reporter on violence against women and girls, uh, with legal and organisational clout. As lesbians, we have to fight this, fight this if we are to have a place for the next generation of lesbians. I want to finish with two short quotes, one from my novel Dark Matters. I cry, I cry for all the women, for all the lesbians, because no one cries for us. And finally, from Nicole Brossard's book, The Aerial Letter, a lesbian who does not reinvent the world is a lesbian in the process of disappearing. Thank you. Here am I chatting away and saying lovely things to Susan and no one can hear me. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for that talk, Susan. I was particularly as chair delighted that you kept to time. I didn't have to come and give you the gong and that was just, you know, such well-timed and such um, 
rich and densely packed talk. Thank you. Um, Cheryl, I've known Cheryl for less long than I've known Susan, but I've known you a while. And Cheryl is a retired sociologist. She lives among the Wijabong people of the Bunjalung Nation in Lisbon. And she didn't always live there, though. She completed her PhD in sociology at James Cook University and in 1999 and with her, did a qualitative study then on involvement in feminist collective action. Her thesis was, was published as the book Stepping Out of Line, Becoming and Being Feminist. It was published by Routledge in 2005. From 1991 until the end of 2006, she taught sociology at James Cook, beginning as a casual and finally ended up as a senior lecturer. She ended up, she left full-time academic work at that time and moved to Melbourne from 2007 to 2010. She worked as a research officer at the Victorian Parliament. She gets around and then she left full-time work in 2010 and became involved in the Greens, so became a political activist of another sort, taking on various branch roles and standing as a candidate in the 2016 federal election. However, as many current and former members of the Greens, Cheryl came up against the dominance of trans ideology and specifically in the Green Women's Network and Queer Greens and was removed from the, the Greens Facebook group in late 2018 and was subject to a formal misconduct complaint. You're in excellent company there, Cheryl, excellent company. We know many women have suffered this. <laughs> Uh, Gia Underwood, Nina Valens, and I can name many more. Seeing mm. that the Greens were increasingly vocal about supporting gender ideology and sanctioning members who refused to go along with it, Cheryl decided, like many other women, Sally O'Will in Tasmania and a whole bunch of others, decided not to continue her membership after moving to New South Wales in 2019. Now, this evening, Cheryl's working on another book, and she's going to tell us all about it. It's called Political Home. This is the provisional title, Politically Homeless, Progressives Rejecting Gender Identity Ideology. So, Cheryl, please talk to us about your current project. Thank you, Roman. And just to um, acknowledge the um, elders in this area where I'm living now, which is in Bundjalung country in Lismore in northern New South Wales. I moved here in 2019 and, as Bronwyn said, I, um, I didn't rejoin the Greens when I moved to New South Wales and I had let my membership in Victoria lapse. Um, so, um, as I said, really very involved with the Greens from 2010 till 2018 uh, in Victoria, in Melbourne. And, you know, within the branch area, it was... Um, you know, there wasn't any issues um, of much rising about this. I do remember being at the initial meeting of the setting up of the Queer Greens and um, for the state and arguing that I didn't like the name and that queer was really, in my view, sort of associated with the sort of neoliberal um, postmodern kind of view of the world, but uh, it you know, most of the people who were involved really just saw it as a, a term, to, as a, an alternative to saying gay and lesbian. So anyway, um, that was fine. Um, until I started posting um, a few uh, gender critical, I suppose, um, items, I, I remember one of the ones that I posted was about the degenderettes and um, many of you will have heard about the degenderettes this terrorist group, really, from San Francisco who um, were turning up to pride marches carrying uh, baseball bats painted in different gender, um, well, the transgender flag, but a whole range of different flags, the queer anarchists and, and whatever, and, and twirling these around in a probably fairly intimidating way. And, of course, uh, talking about lesbians, you know, very much their target was lesbians who turned up at Pride and wanted, um, you know, to to um, uh, show pride in being lesbians. You know, the dyke marches and things that have been turned into almost transgender marches. So uh, anyway, that uh, was one. I think there was another time I posted a story about some young radical feminists at a university in uh, the UK that uh, did a fundraising or did something and they had vagina cupcakes 
and the trans activists sort of shut that down. It was terribly transphobic and uh, I posted about that. Um, the first thing that was rather hilarious was getting little messages back saying that this post should have come with a trigger warning um, because it was so upsetting to the trans uh, members. Anyway, by about 2018, I was getting the phone calls from some gay male uh, colleagues in the Greens who were basically friends who were ringing very concerned that there was talk about kicking me off the queer Greens and um, wanting to sort of educate me so that I could avoid that uh, dias um, result. And I basically said, please just take me off. I don't want to be part of the queer Greens anymore. Um, another ex sort of humorous, I think, experience was with the, um, the, the Greens Women's Network on Facebook and having um, a bit of an argument once, it, it, it very quickly became dominated by men, by uh, men who identified as women. And one who, if you've been following any of the stuff about the Greens in Victoria and even articles that have been published in The Age, there was a, there's a young, youngish transgender identified male called Bianca Haven. Bianca told me that I needed to read Judith Butler uh, to which I explained that I had read Judith Butler before he was born. <laughs> so when when her book first came out in 1991. So anyway, I did stand for the Greens in 2016. Uh, and one of the things I loved about that is I stood in the seat of Goldstein, named after Vida Goldstein, wonderful first wave uh, feminist and, and suffragist. and and. Uh, yeah, I, I still um, look very fondly on Vida. Um, I should have got it down. Up on the top of my uh, bookcase there is a little doll I made that was Vida and she came round Australia with me in 2021 and I took photos of her with little signs saying women won't wish at Uluru and women won't wish in Broken Hill and whatever. Anyway, um but I, I was also, so um, then in 2018 I had um, one of these dis misconduct things raised against me by one of the trans-identified boys, I call them the boys in dresses on the greens, and I did, it, it actually made me feel quite ill at the time and, you know, like just really stressed out and I put it aside and I didn't, you know, I wasn't going to respond. And then eventually I thought, don't be silly, you know, I'd, and I'd calm down and I had some spare time and I wrote a response. And, of course, you know, I knew all the theory and everything, so it wasn't hard to demolish what he was saying. So I did. And interestingly, the dispute was dropped. And I think what happened is that... Uh, young Effie realised that he was up against someone who knew what she was talking about and wasn't going to be re-educated by this boy. Um, so, but um, I follow, I continued to sort of be aware of what was happening in the Greens. I met Nina Valens. I met her. I never used to go to state things, but I went to the state council meeting uh, when... Linda Gale and, and others were uh, had had put forward a paper um, on the trans issue, and that's when I actually got up quite bravely because I'm really actually quite a wuss. <laughs> I got up very bravely. I wore a t-shirt, an old feminist t-shirt that said "Nice got me nowhere," and I stood up and I said, "I just don't feel that the Greens are a, a safe. No, I didn't use safe. A welcoming place for lesbians." And that was true. There was just, you know, and I would have thought it may have been, you know, when I first joined. I, and I wouldn't say that was the case out in, in the branch, you know, or, or in terms of how people related to me individually, it, it wasn't. But, you know, when I went to Pride in Melbourne with the Greens and I was the only lesbian, you know, it was, it was sort of like, you know, there were men there were gay men. There was Janet Rice and her husband, who was a, a Tim. 
Um, but when I got up and said this, I was laughed at by Senator Rice. And uh, so that was pretty awful. But I was also well aware of what had happened when Margot Oliver, who was in the Greens in Sydney, had written a piece for a newsletter and all hell broke loose and Mayreen Faruqi and, and all the other Greens um, parliamentarians in New South Wales, you know, and all of them, well, you know, even the federal ones all put apologies on Facebook and apologies to the trans community. But I, um, and I used to sort of think I should write something about this, but I'm lazy and I enjoy travelling around in my van and just enjoying retirement. But early this year when Adam Bant on Twitter smeared all of the women who went to the uh, Let Women Speak rally in Melbourne, Holly Lawford-Smith, Nina Valens, uh, you know, Nina who is Jewish herself, you know, women who have been on the left, not all of them but a lot of them for years. Sheila Jeffries was there uh, when they were all smeared by uh, Adam Bant as Nazis and I read through all the comments, you know, 300, took me hours and they were all pushing back and so many women posting and saying, I feel politically homeless. I've been on the left all my life and I've, and I've been a feminist or I've been an environmentalist and I just thought, okay, I've got to do something. I've got to write this. So I um, put together a set of questions. I Some of the people that I've uh, sent these to and got answers back from or done Zoom interviews with are women that I know of or I, were friends, you know, or acquaintances and um, through networks. Some of them I just cold called basically through Twitter. They put on a Twitter post saying, you know, I've supported the Greens for years and I'm politically homeless. Um, I just direct messaged them and said I'm doing this. So um, at the moment I've, I've uh, collected stories from 12 women and one man um, and I'm still just working on that. I've started drafting chapters. I have an outline. I'm working on a book proposal. And uh, so basically that's my, my project. I, I think one of the things that's really struck me is how, um, how the impact this has on women who have devoted so much time and energy uh, into, you know, these political causes, whether it's, um, you know, through feminism or environmentalism, whether it's... They're not all people who have been members of political parties, although quite a few of them have been, um, but just women who are committed to progressive politics whatever, however you define that, and they're just feeling like they're being kicked in the, you know, kicked under the bus and they're, um, yeah, feeling politically homeless, I suppose. So, yeah, that's probably it. I don't know how I'm going for time. I didn't really take notice of what time, uh, how long we were supposed to speak for, but that's probably enough just to say that's what I'm doing. If there's anyone who's in the audience here who's interested in um, contributing, happy to hear from you. I can't remember the mic this time. Thank you, Cheryl. Very, very good timekeeping from you as well. And that's a fabulous project and I hope you get lots of women talking to you. If it's some, um, if it's, if it's, Restricted to the Greens, I'm sure there are a lot of women from the ALP who probably talk to you as well. But you know, I know the Greens has been a particularly nasty, nasty battle. And and you know, and I also forgot to mention Anna, who's with us tonight. Of course, Anna has you know had a huge run in, and she got expelled from the New South Wales Greens. So she's she's had a really hard time with them as well. Anna, so, Anna's um, already on on side and has has responded to my questions and, and it's not necessarily only member people who have been members of parties they may well have just been um involved in say environmental activism or women's act whatever it is where they're 
feeling like they've been shunned, if you like, or ostracised within those um, areas? Well, I think it's a very important conversation because part of the problem now is that because the rights grabbed hold of this um, battle mm. and because women feel disenfranchised by the left-wing parties for which we've all, always voted and of which many of us have been members, that you know, women are now running to the right. I think that's a bad call personally, but I think it's really, really, really need to talk about this from the left and how the left has betrayed us as women. And we need to yeah. keep in that conversation on the left flank of the left, which is why we set up Australian Feminist for Women's Rights as well. But mm. before getting more into the discussion, I should probably move on to our last speaker who has been waiting so patiently, and it's later there than it is here as well in Australia. So, you know, she's, she's much closer to her bedtime than we are to ours. So Sabina Schneider has been a lesbian activist since the early 1980s and over time has been a member of various lesbian and women's groups. For more than a decade, she was part of a collective that produced, as in manufactured, produced, I mean, a feminist man, ma magazine. Almost all the productive members of the collective were lesbians. And isn't that a story that's familiar to us? Sabina comes from a working class background and has worked as a cleaner, cook, preschool teacher, compositor, graphic designer, writer, editor, translator, IT teacher, baker, community educator, and I think that's executive assistant EA. Yeah? She currently works as a secretary and is co-founder also of Lesbian Resistance New Zealand, which was formed last year to draw attention to the ongoing abolition of sex in favour of the made up concept of gender in law and society there. Lesbian resistance aims to protect existing or reclaim already lost sex-based rights of women and girls, as well as the rights of lesbians, without compromise. <clears throat> Lesbian Resistance New Zealand focuses on street action and conversations with everyday people like us. I don't know, I've, I've sort of never understood what an everyday person is, you know. I guess we're all everyday in some way and we're all exceptional in some way, but yes, that's probably a conversation we need to have at some stage. What, what is an everyday person? It's a, it's a question that's always puzzled me. But beside working in lesbian resistance, Sabine has also co-founded the WDI Australia New Zealand Lesbian Caucus, of which the Coalition of Activist Lesbians is also becoming part, I believe, and it's still in the process of being set up. So we're just beginning those conversations. And this evening, Sabine is going to be telling us about both these initiatives and how they came about. So over to you. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> um, my uh, talk will be about these uh, two lesbian groups um, that uh, Bronwyn has just introduced. Uh, in a way, it's even three groups. I'll tell you more about that. Um, I first talk a bit about uh, lesbian resistance and then about the WDI, Australia New Zealand Lesbian Caucus. Um, we formed uh, Lesbian Resistance in 2022 to fight gender identity ideology, gender identity. I always say that in inverted commas. And uh, also to be visible as working class lesbians, because listening to the voices of uh, working class women uh, can all uh, can only be uh, to all our advantage, methinks. Um, we don't want to stay in an echo chamber, but uh, we want to learn from each other. That's what I think. Uh, and bounce off ideas, um, which I find important. Uh, in the understanding uh, of this ideology-driven movement, um, the working classes have been almost entirely ignored, uh, probably because the woke are mostly um, the young the white, the privileged, um, and they are, of course, uh, whipped up and funded by old, older men. Um, most working class people are not activists. Uh, they're probably too busy making a living. And maybe they are not yet sucked into the cult um, after all the ideologues were bred in universities. We wanted uh, a lesbian group that uh, fights for the rights of women and girls without any compromise, uh, because no man can ever be any kind of woman. And uh, we definitely never use preferred pronouns and under no circumstances. Um, lesbian resistance uh, practically exploded into action 
uh, street action uh, when Kelly J. Keene and the other women at Albert Park in Auckland in March were uh, so viciously attacked. Uh, we were so angry about that um, calculated violent attack First of all, um, members of the Green Party had applied to Immigration New Zealand uh, to prevent her from coming into the country uh, in the first place. And then um, that character assassination, basically, that is actually still ongoing. Um, all this was instigated and uh, egged on by the government and uh, spread by the government-funded uh, mainstream media who lie, who still lie, uh, they falsified facts and even images. You might remember those images. We totally lost faith in the police that day. Uh, we were supposed to be there, but they were obviously ordered uh, not to protect women. All this uh, gave this uh, vicious mob um, permission to attack. We were really, really angry um, not just because it robbed us uh, <laughs> of the um, opportunity to talk in Wellington the next day. Um, so we were really angry, but uh, rather than focusing on our anger, we decided to turn that energy into positive action. Uh, we advocate in our local town, which is a rural town, it's small, um, we do that because it's easier. It's not too far to drive for us. Uh, petrol is really expensive. Also because rural people don't like to be lectured by out-of-towners. So uh, we lecture them. No, it's just kidding. Um, but that is also because uh, rural um, people are uh, sort of farming people. Um, and they they speak our language, we speak their language. Um, we rather than approaching them, uh, we let people come up to us. Um, they usually ask about our placards. Uh, we got loads of them, you know, the usual um, no child is born in the wrong body, um, get the rainbow out of schools and school boards and uh, Lately, we take the repeal sex self ID. Um, uh, we take that often because um, oh, we we go every every week, every Friday. Um, like the women, the awesome women in Ballarat. <laughs> um, anyway, the the repeal sex self ID is very uh, timely, pertinent uh, because. Uh, the sex self ID in New Zealand has been introduced uh, into law last year, but it has been passed into law uh, only la last week um, on the 15th. Um, overwhelmingly, we get uh, really positive uh, responses. Um, sadly, and quite tellingly, um, it is many people, especially women, are too afraid to show their faces um, in our videos. So we try our best to record their descent um, as best we can. Um, we give them pamphlets and small info cards. Here's one with websites. These small cards, as a little aside, um, are uh, taken more willingly than the bigger sheets of paper, than pamphlets and stuff, um, because they can just tuck it away quickly. At the moment, it is really lovely in our little town um, because in the middle of the so-called pride, uh, nothing to be proud about there, um, of this pride month, uh, Fielding, that's our little town, is absolutely free of the degenerate uh, rainbow flag uh, or any other rainbow virtue signaling. There's just nothing of it. There's just us. <laughs> um, for us, it was really important to have the word lesbian in our name. It's not just because uh, we like to say lesbian, lesbian, lesbian. It's because lesbians, our lesbian bodies, we do like saying lesbian, 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 um, we are the last bastion of single-sex spaces. As a lesbian, 
as lesbians, we are the embodiment of a single sex space. That's why we are in such danger, but that's also uh, why we are so dangerous. Um, the ideology or um, rather the ideologues, they are hell bent to er erase not only women as a sex class, but uh, especially lesbians can't be tolerated. Uh, the latest attempt, um, uh, Susan has mentioned it, I think, before, uh, to erase us was calling us non-men attracted to other non-men, which I want to laugh about it, but it's an ab absolute outrage, really. Um, lesbian resistance, of course, is also passionate about uh, free speech. Uh, doesn't matter whether it's in writing or on social media or especially... Um, in the public square, in our little rallies, uh, we absolutely need to uh, voice our opinions um, publicly. Uh, one of the reasons, and that is a deeper reason for this, is that some of us have lived through a time when we had to hide and we couldn't say the dirty L word. We lived more or less uh, secretly. Um, those of us who were more out uh, made a huge effort uh, to make all those heterosexual people around us uh, more comfortable by calling ourselves gay, which is somehow considered more polite. I think it's a little bit like uh, sex and gender here. Um, to be able to live freely and openly as lesbians, uh, we absolutely need a healthy, democratic, free society with free speech. We cannot do this on our own. Um, and that's uh, all about Lesbian Resistance New Zealand. Um, and now I'll say a brief spiel about the WDI Australia New Zealand Lesbian Caucus, which came about almost by accident. <laughs> I'm very often in awe of some of the women I see on YouTube the likes of uh, Sheila Jeffries, Julia Long, Julie Bindle, who have uh, been talking about this for years and years. I personally think Kelly J. Keene is a wonder woman. Um, they sometimes state basic facts in a way that uh, blows my mind, like Kara Dunsky did the other day. She was on some television show recently, and uh, she said in the most matter-of-fact way, the very, th the very thing that uh, many others are just sort of dancing around and uh, usually avoiding altogether. Um, and I have to quote, quote that. Um, she said, there is no such thing as trans, and it's okay to say that. It's a lie. It's a fabricated lie. Every single human being on the face of the planet is either female or male, and there's no other category of people. The simplicity of it. Uh, so I asked her, can I put this video a snippet on our website? And she came back and said, yeah, of course you can. And she also said she'd passed on our email to Lauren Levy, who um, together with other lesbians, of course, had just formed the Lesbian Caucus of the WDI USA. Lauren, um, she wrote us a lovely email and uh, suggested a meeting, which we had, and we enjoyed very much. Um, and during that talk, Lauren came up with the idea that um, New Zealand could also form a lesbian caucus and we could all work together. And we thought that was a um, really a great idea, and so we just ran with it. We did it. Um, the WDI, Australia, and New Zealand are working together um, on many levels, uh, at least it looks like that. Uh, so it made sense for us to um, uh, set the lesbian caucuses up uh, so that they also have this close cooperation. So just a few weeks ago, we officially formed the WDI Australia New Zealand Lesbian Caucus. However, the Australian part of it is still very much uh, a, whip, a work in progress. Actually, uh, all of it is <laughs> very much in the make. Uh, for now, we're looking at uh, how to develop a structure 
for ourselves and we are pondering some projects to work on. We've got some ideas. Uh, we already have a website, uh, which is very conveniently hosted on uh, the Lesbian Resistance website. Um, you might want to go and have a look. Uh, we also have both as Lesbian Resistance and as WDI, uh, Australia New Zealand Lesbian Caucus, adopted the Lesbian Bill of Rights, which was written by our sisters at the Lesbian Caucus of the WDI US. And it's an awesome set of principles. And I encourage you to have a look, look at it. At, um, it's on their website, but of course you can also find it uh, on our website. Um, that's it from, from me. Uh, I will be back at some stage uh, to report on progress. And um, yeah, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Vivian. I've just put the, um, just for the participants here, I've just put the um, URL for the Lesbian Resistance website, which I just Googled. I and mean, it's pretty easy to find. You just put Lesbian Resistance NZ and it comes up straight away. So I've just put the URL for it um, in the chat. And um, Anna McCormack has just um, put in the chat also that some of us will be speaking or have our papers read by other people because we can't personally be there um, at the Brisbane Mianjin Lesbian Conference in September. So it's open to yeah. lesbian and non-lesbian women, just as this is today, but um, the speakers are lesbian. So it's really foregrounding lesbian voices in this struggle that, you know, as, as we've said tonight, we've been waging for so, so, so long.